and we're looking for ways to just pull our ideas and thoughts and resources to share. And this is one way and one platform. Um, it's it's an amazing group of people. I'm finally getting to put faces to names. Uh, and so I say welcome to our panelists. Thank you for your time and your thoughts and your ideas. Uh, we have a range of folks here and I let them introduce themselves. Uh, we have Carol Foster from uh, Joy of Motion. We have Mary Brown from Life Pieces uh, to Masterpieces. And we have um, Rasha Abdul Hadi with Split from Split This Rock. It's a distinguished group of people. I'm really eager to um, get our conversation started. So I'll just maybe uh, begin with you, Ms. Carol, and say, um, please introduce yourself and say a few words about your um, your organization to, to just get us started. And then uh, Mary and, and uh, Rasha, and we'll get going. Thank you, guys. Well, good day, everyone, and I'm so glad I got on board here. I do apologize. It was so crazy for a minute. We said yesterday, technology is great when it works. You know? <laughs> so, anyway, I am Carol Foster, and I am actually the Special Programs Associate for the International Association of Blacks and Dance. I chair the board of Joy of Motion, and this is a very recent new cap. I'm also an emergency preparedness consultant for the arts and um, happy to be here and be a part of this discussion and I'm going to pass the feather. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, okay, good morning. My name is Mary Brown. I'm the co founder and executive director of life pieces to masterpieces for 25 years. We've been using arts to uh, develop character and unlock potential of African-American males ages three to adulthood, living in wards seven and eight of Washington, DC. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to share and learn from all of you. Hi everyone, my name is Rasha Abdul Hadi. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm joining you today as executive director at Split This Rock. Uh, Split This Rock is a, about 11 years old this year as a nonprofit, but the programs and the community of DC poets who organize for social activism going to the DC Poets Against the War goes back um, almost 20 years. So it's a deep community of poetry here in DC that really spans across communities and across generations. Um, Split This Rock is a national organization that's based here. So we host a national festival usually every two years. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, I think. And uh, there are also um, programs for all ages and for youth here in the district and in the DC metro area. So that includes after school youth poetry programs, a national poem of the week publication, uh, monthly open mic and featured readings, as well as free workshops, which have continued virtually through the pandemic time. That's it for me for today. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I think a good, maybe a good place to start might be to you know, sort of look back, not that we're out of the out of the woods um, even now, but but to think back through maybe sort of the year that we've had and, and one can reflect on on many different levels, uh, but think in terms of, you know, maybe, you know, share a little bit about what what your organizations, your colleagues, your uh, staff folks have gone through this past year, um, trying to make sense of, of working in the COVID environment and, and keeping creativity going. Um, what has the year sort of been like um, for each of you? I'm, um, because you're dealing with different kinds of art forms, you know, visual arts, poetry, um, dance, it's, you know, different arrangements lend themselves for different art you know i mean writing you can do pretty much in in isolation uh theater you can't do in isolation you know it's it, it, it's different things for different art forms so I, I i i wonder how have you seen your community your organization cope over the changes that have happened uh this past year and uh, and i'll keep it open i'm happy to keep it open in case uh folks would like to jump in to start um, I can start. Please. So, um, I guess the piece that I left out about 
um, my intro is that I have been doing the arts in DC with young people for about 50 years. So I'm a Carol Soros, but. Certainly in my work with emergency preparedness, in my work with IEBD, I touch on a lot of dance organizations throughout the DMV. And fortunately, I can say they are still standing. Uh, everybody may be bruised, they may be heads bowed and bloody, but everybody's still standing and everybody is, you know, working. They have truly indicated resilience. Uh, mm -hmm. Joy of motion is a new hat. I'm always putting on new hats. <laughs> it has it has been a tumultuous year for Joy of Motion. Um, coming out of not only COVID-19, but hit with a discriminant, uh, discriminatory action uh, where there was a petition, there were all kinds of uh, painful, painful things. And this has been a really, really hard year for the organization because so many people prior to Black Lives Matter felt very pained by their experience there in many ways. So the organization really got hit with two things. It got hit with COVID-19 and it got hit with reality in terms of its existence. So it, it you know, talk about being on a lifeboat and sculling and all of that. It literally has been in that place. And I don't know how I got into it because it's like, you know, <laughs> saying, do you want a ticket to the Titanic? And I'm going to assure you there are no lifeboats. <laughs> <laughs> and you took the ticket. <laughs> I took the ticket. So uh -huh. I, say, I do at other people's weddings. So, <laughs> so I, I have been in this, uh, you know, or to revive the organization and not there because this is the first time they've had this many people of color in the inner workings as it is. So not to be my term that I borrowed from someone on another meeting, an inclusion, what is it? An illusion of inclusion, you know, not to be that. And, and to get the organization to have some real ideas around turning, turning itself around. It, it has been my most fragile organization. And I mean, I work with folks the DMV all the way from here, Richmond, Hampton, you know, the whole nine yards. And mm. this has probably been the most fragile organization. And the fact that it is still standing really uh, goes to the resilience of the staff that's still left and the people that still support it after all that has gone through. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Mary, you. yes, yes, you look like you're about to, yeah. Oh, I, well, because I, I, I could feel it. It's been an extraordinarily mm -hmm. painful year. Uh, at Life Pieces to Masterpieces, uh, uh, just to give you a contextual framework of, of the challenges, we had uh, over 15 family members uh, of our children who died of COVID. We had um, uh, about one or two suicides. During this period of time, we had other family members who had died, but not from COVID. And we had, I believe, approximately two of our previous gentlemen who had been connected to Life Pieces die as a result of gun violence. And so for us, uh, the day that the schools announced that they would be closing was also a day that we got a phone call from a parent saying that she had lost her job, and was given her her uh, last check, had to catch several buses, and uh, uh, you know finally when she cashed her check, then went to the supermarket, nothing was there, and so we get the phone call at one or two in the morning, and so ever since that we've been going nonstop, and if I have anything to share is that, like Peace's existence for twenty five years has our existence has been our resistance. It's almost as though we have existed to meet this moment. Uh, at Life Pieces, uh, as I shared, you know, I, and our little boys will even say this, and I'm so happy when you see people with the button on the screen, that's the LPTM staff. So when we get to questions and answers and, and management team, you can ask them a few questions too. Uh, but, but well, you know, our little boys will say, like pieces to masterpieces, provide opportunities for African-American males, <laughs> ages three to 25. 
to discover and activate their innate creative ability to change challenges into possibilities. So that's why we exist, to change challenges into possibilities. So when we were hit with this, not being connected was not an option. We did know we had to do virtual. We pivoted very quickly to that. But then we're a human development organization. My heart goes out to the performance groups, the groups that rely on getting seats in and people sitting there. My heart goes out to you, and I hope that we're going to be able to share some things that could assist you. But we're hardwired. Our non-negotiable reason for being is for our boys and young men and for our organization to look at life through a four-part process. How do we take a situation, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, and connect and stay connected so that we can move together? And this is something, again, that, that we've done for 25 years. We needed a framework for our children to give sense to a lot of the insanity in their lives. So first we connect. And then when we connect, oh, we got to create because that's some stuff going on. It has to come out in some kind of way. Song, dance, drumming, art, poetry. And then we have to give. We can't just lick our wounds. What can we do to create change? And then you always have to celebrate. So for us, that four C's, our mission is what carried us through this, but then running into beautiful human beings like sister, like, uh, like Rasha. You know, Rasha, they, they helped us so very much. It was a, a phone call I could pick up. And I know that, that they'll be able to share more of that with you. But partnerships like uh, with Rasha, who could have easily said, you know, I'm going to keep my resources to myself. What they did was provide us with resources. So that's amazing. That's amazing, Mary, because it speaks to both the resilience that um, um, Carol mentioned, um, but also community, also also generosity of spirit. I don't think any, you know, most people who work in the arts are just generous of spirit, I, I, I find. And there's this, there's this communal, we will survive it together if we share what it is that we have spirit about folks who works in, who work in the arts and and i think that also adds to that resilience that you know you face things together you stand together you you think together you problem solve together and all of that comes into play uh, when when the hard stuff hits um that's 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 amazing uh rasha i'd love to hear your thoughts um how how have you guys fared last year it's been this yeah rock. you know it's been a really um I hesitate to use the word interesting, but it's been quite a journey um, with Split This Rock. So a year ago, we were still scheduled to host our national conference that happens once every two years. It was going to be happening. It would have just happened. Actually, a year ago today, on the 24th, would have been the day that we would have opened our national festival. Um, and we had been following the um, pandemic in part because there was a national literary conference in San Antonio, um, AWP, for folks who are in that world, um, that was really on the edge. And we had to decide whether we were going to travel there. And I, I was scheduled to go there. I was scheduled to present there. We were supposed to table there and do outreach for the festival. And so that was really a moment. Um, I think we were uh, thinking about it just a few weeks ahead of some of the other folks in our networks. Um, and it meant that um, because of some of the research and decision making we made to not go and travel there, um, that really informed how we were thinking about the festival. And we uh, you know, it's really interesting. We knew that we were going to have to not host the festival probably about a week and a half before we were able to announce it publicly. And so we gave a lot of um, kind of uh, just watch and see notices to folks who were scheduled to come. And we sort of gave a few heads up, but there, something that I wanna get into as well today is thinking about like, how do we do these dual strategies of care for community and navigating all of these legal financial mm -hmm. systems, right? So there are all, all these contracts that we had in place, right? Tens of thousands of dollars um, that as an organization, if we wanted to keep paying staff and to pay the artists rather than to pay for buildings that we weren't gonna be in, we had to be a little careful about when and how we did a cancellation, right? Mm. 
So mm-hmm. uh, there's there's all these uh, things that really don't live at my heart, but that we had to play a lot of protective uh, strategy around to care right. to the folks in our community. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, I'm very glad that we didn't try to host the festival. We uh, we were, you know, DC would have been shut down. If we had not already been doing the planning, it wouldn't have been in our, in our it wouldn't have been our choice anyway, but because we did the planning, we were better prepared to communicate with our networks. Um, it has been, I really appreciate Mary saying this, it has been clear to me, I have a background as a community organizer, so I have, I've done mutual aid work before, I've been part of a mutual aid work group here in DC since the pandemic and before, and the um, it was clear to me from the beginning that we nationally, globally, weren't going to get through this uh, as a sort of, I'm going to keep what's mine strategy. <laughs> the scale of the crisis is so much bigger than any person, any organization, any city, any state, any nation. Uh, that those resources have to be shared. That's the only way to meet the scale of the problem. So Split This Rock has been a part of a lot of coalition work, and we have really focused on um, showing up for those conversations. How do we share resources, whether it's, you know, I'm on a call with the Poetry Coalition and I'm finding out about individual artist assistance awards. How can I create a document to share with all the teaching artists, all the poets, even some of our board members who are teaching artists who need that income to survive and are affected by it? Um, I went through periods where mentors of mine were also people were losing sixteen thousand dollars in a week because they, you know, gigs were getting canceled immediately. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we really. We didn't necessarily go into rapid response. Split This Rock is a very small organization and we don't have a lot of the physical infrastructure that would make those um, those connections possible, but we did a lot of resource compiling. Like, here's where you can get things. And we did a lot of work to try to talk with other folks. Like, here are grant opportunities. We're not eligible for this. You should absolutely apply. Mm. Um, and and thinking about individual, we almost did sort of social work spaces. We were working mm-hmm. with contracted artists about how do you access this new unemployment insurance that's available for contractors rather than just staff members. Uh, we did a lot, and we it also required a lot of internal conversations. I you know we can talk a little bit more about it later. Um, I'm a relatively new executive director. This would have. 2020 was the beginning of my second full year, so I'd only really been in the job for a little over a year. Um, and so that uh, that brings its own interesting uh, challenges as you navigate, how do you create consent and consensus among staff and board um, at a time where the organization is still in transition or redeveloping and really, um, you know, I won't, I won't sugarcoat it. A lot of folks were scared and there were folks who were like, we should just shut down the organization. We should, we should hunker down. We should, you know, try to weather this out and then we'll come back and, you know, we'll furlough folks. And then, you know, maybe folks will be better off on unemployment. And I'll be frank, I was horrified. And, uh, and I said, no, we're not going to do that. Split This Rock is a social justice organization. If we're not here for our community now, then why do we exist? And if we don't have anything that we can offer right now, then why are we going to be valuable in sunnier days that come later? So, um, you know, we have really, there there are a lot of challenges and changes. We've definitely pulled back from some programming. We're having to do a lot of, it's led to some space and also a necessity to do some assessment of, you know, what is our capacity as, as an organization with only four full-time staff people? Uh, and what can we commit to and what's the most important work that we can offer in the communities that we're active in? Um, and so that's, those are interesting questions. They're still being mm-hmm. answered. Um, but I'm really grateful to be here with you all today and also to hear and talk about how as a field and as a physical community in DC, we're, we're trying to hold this time. Mm. Thank you, Rasha. There's, there's so much, there's so much in, in all of what you've said. Um, I know for us, for example, given that we're a district government agency, we're sort of in the rubrics of a larger frame and the mayor uh, had very sort of decisive leadership in how she was going to um, approach this public health emergency. 
one of the the top priorities that she had identified for for the entire district government was to really not go go down the path of, of furlough and and um, you know uh, laying off staff or anything like that and so um, that felt to all of us the right way to go um, but but in some ways you know that doesn't allay all the fears there's still sort of this the the fears may still exist you know the paycheck may be coming but the it's a very changed environment we're working online there's not the physical sort of cues and and uh, checking in that one would normally do and so that by itself didn't answer for all of the the vulnerabilities that people felt yeah and so you know i i felt that for example in my situation i felt as though i really had to pull together the right resources for staff for the agency to survive this we'd been thinking about this for a while but all of a sudden it became imperative there was no way forward unless we could really talk through uh some communication pieces some you know just be intentional about how we did that work of supporting each other um in this virtual space now um and and it also brings me to the question of um how were you all as leaders i mean rasha said you know she was fairly new i was fairly new in the same way i was maybe a year and a half or so into from the interim to the acting to you know the the, the full um and i i think i wasn't even confirmed by the time that the uh COVID situation hit um but but how did you all self care even you know you as leaders or, or your managers or the immediate group how was that for you all as as individuals trying to you know push this forward and 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 provide care for community how how did you approach it for yourselves even as a question i'll start again <laughs> yes please Sitting around uh, yes yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. I think um, I can speak for IEBD, and I thought what we did was really good. First, um, way before COVID, we got into this emergency preparedness piece, and that was a blessing because we had put together an emergency plan, which I advise for everybody while we have this moment off to start looking at your emergency plans, your business continuity. It, it really it really is essential and you know now that we've been through this crisis and we're still going through it we see the real value of it but there were other things that were happening so many other things that were happening uh one of our dance icons melvin deal from african heritage dancers and drummers he got COVID, and just trying to round up his circle of people everybody wanted to help but just trying to coordinate his circle to put them in gear to help him. And so we were able to do that. Um, at IEBD, we also, uh, which I thought was really, really good for everyone, we took a pause. We really just took a pause. And uh, Denise Saunders Thompson, who is the president and CEO, she said, look, you know, especially when Black Lives Matter hit and people were just, they didn't know how to feel. You know, um, she said, if you need to take some time, to digest and to just reflect or whatever you need, take that time. So she allowed the staff to do that and advise other people and other organizations to do the same thing. Um, so taking that pause to really reflect and, and deal with what was going on and the statement, how are you doing, really became more impactful. You know, it's not, you really it's it's more than just how 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 you doing you know it's how are you doing how are you making it and so we were asking that more i know that i ended up talking one dancer off the ledge because of you know she didn't know what she was going to do about her company she's an emerging choreographer emerging company and what do i do and i just don't know and we had all these things lined up you know and i said just take that pause and then make yourself visible. And yeah. so I think I have to speak to everyone's uh, resourcefulness and necessity being the mother of invention. I am so proud and pleased at the dance community because we were truly hit hard. 
and the ability to take this new platform and this new, all these new mediums and, and make it work, you know, maybe not especially perfect, but make it work and still be out there. So I, I think the strength again goes back to, you know, we take that punch and uh, I think Les Brown says, if you can look up, you can get up. And so people could look up. So they did get up and they started dancing in that little box. <laughs> so, so, we saw that on TV quite a bit. I saw it on YouTube and, and social media, just people making it work in tiny spaces in, in you know, you know, little staircase underneath staircase spaces kind of thing. It's just it's really amazing, isn't it? The human spirit and, and the creativity. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Hate, we hated it. We hated it. But yeah. we made it work. Right. So right. I yeah, it goes to the yeah. resourcefulness and necessity is the mother of invention, you know. Oh. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Mary, please, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna be real. I was afraid. I was one afraid 57 year old black woman. I was scared out of my ever loving mind. And some people that I have here, I'm gonna just put them on out there. I don't know if you see the, the woman there with the, with the little shield and the eyeglasses. That's my biological sister, Aunt Lo. <laughs> All right. You're going to see a strong young Hello, man. Aunt Lo. <laughs> this brother Maurice, he could wave his hand. And, and, and he even told me he was hey, at the time. And then we have Donnell. That's Maurice's brother that grew up in the organization. Donnell, raise, raise your hand. I wanted to make sure that members of my team, brother heart and soul, and he just has a new baby. Come on now. All right. So I want to tell you something. I was one afraid sister. I needed help. Because when I got that phone call, all I knew was to connect, create. My, main, my brain went immediately into our process. We have to stay connected. Okay, we have to make certain that parents, and so thankfully, thankfully, because we are an arts-based education program, we had resources. But I'm gonna tell you four key things that led to some of the peace in my life. One, I had a, I, I, one, we, we, our entire board, our staff, our boys and young men, we are clear on our non-negotiable reason for being. We provide opportunities for African-American males to discover and activate their innate creative ability to change challenges into possibility through creative expression. That is why we exist. So we couldn't stop. Stopping wasn't a thing. And so thankfully we have a board that jumped out there with us because boards could stop you in your tracks. Oh my God, I don't know. You, you want to go door to door and drop things off or you want to put this other thing in the bus. Thankfully, we had a board who had the back of the leadership. And so we were able to move smoothly. Also, we were small, so we could move and execute our four seats. That's the thing that gave me some of the peace. And then from that, really since June, Aunt Lo, I think it was since June of 2020, we've been doing in-person, outdoor, socially distant programming at Marvin Gaye Greening Center, as well as virtual. And so, so taking care of our families, making certain they got food, everything they needed, getting partners in, creating art. If you were to go to lifepieces.org, you could check out, or even Courage on Canvas. Uh, dot, I think it's courageoncanvas.org. Uh, you can see all the work that we did through the summer, through the whole Black Lives Matter, through everything, uh, even the newsletter that we came out with today. We never stopped creating because we live to create. What, uh, our primary founder, Larry Quick, that is his mantra. I live to create. And like pieces, we live to create. So we couldn't stop creating. So we had the great fortune to have a, a agreed upon non-negotiable reason for being, a governance structure that allowed us to do it. And then we had a, a, a resource structure. So with the board can make decisions how we could reapportion, you know, certain resources to respond. And then what happened was that other donors that had been with us for the full 25 years were seeing what we were doing and were like, whoa. And then after talking to Rasha and getting connected me to an amazing support, we were able to get the support we need to fulfill our mission. And believe it or not, right now, Life Pieces, we're probably, 
in one of the better, now we're never in the best, but we're in one of the better fiscal positions that we've been in in 25 years of the organization. We never stopped creating art. And all we kept thinking about, even our babies, the four C's, when we come online like this with the babies, connect, create, contribute, celebrate, connect, create. We just had to keep thinking in that process because this was some painful stuff. And when that stuff went down with George Floyd and our babies saw life being choked mm. out of someone that looks like them and mm. their daddy and whatever, we had to use our arts. We had to use our creativity because we lived to create and we had to execute, connect. Create, contribute, celebrate. And That's and I think gift. I think in that what a beautiful gift, Mary, honestly. Um I think in that 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 doesn't deny life, that doesn't deny grief or pain or processing in any way. It's actually providing a way for it to to channel, you know, sort of because because grief grief has to happen too. I mean, this loss is real loss. All of what you're speaking of is is real loss, you know, so it's not to be glossed over. It's not just numbers. It's it's lives. It's people. It's, you know, it's upending many families, all of it, you know, the, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and, and all of the violence that we witnessed. And it's it's not a joke. Um, and so I think what what you're saying is that this isn't it's not to shut down or to channel differently. It's just to sort of find a way to express what's coming up and, and using the arts and, and community to do that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Russia. I, we're going to go the, the other way the next time around. <laughs> I don't. I'm, just to mix it up. <laughs> fine by me. I'm glad to listen and be witness. Um, yes. Uh, so the question yeah. was, you know, sort of how did you manage to self-care? How did you manage to um, sort of keep yourself going as as leaders, um, or trying to sort of you know move 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 it along with with community. How how was it for you, and where did you find respite um, or or strength? Yeah, I um, I don't know that I have a comforting answer to this question. So mm. uh, I I might find myself offering whatever insights I have, maybe a little bit in resistance to this question. Mm -hmm. I appreciate asking. Fair enough. Fair I enough. think it's a question that I hope we do ask of each other and keep asking to care for each other. Um, uh, this has been a really naked time in uh, American uh, and in global politics, society. Uh, it has been maybe a naked time in people's interpersonal relationships maybe even at work in terms of uh, what this crisis reveals about people's instincts, choices, values, capacities, um, or maybe even what each of us have been pushing ourselves to do or how we've been pushing ourselves to fit. Um, and I think a lot about Arundhati Roy's uh, call for us to think of this as a portal time. This is a passage that we are going through and I, um, I find myself often in some of these coalition conversations or um, with uh, major foundations in particular, um, there's an urge to talk about resilience as a return to normal or to praise resilience as uh, something that like is a virtue that we have rather than as a trauma that all of our communities are desperately trying to survive. That um, I, so I think I I feel grief when I hear the word resilience um, because it I feel like I've seen some and I'll say that the commission is not one of these funders but I've seen some other foundations really um, put out uh, calls for proposals about innovation or resilience that really feel like um, we're supposed to tap dance for our lives that and for the lives of our communities that we're supposed to try to prove that we're winning the pandemic when our national government wasn't even doing anything, much less winning the pandemic, much less winning a, an, a desperate response to the, the call for racial justice and the defense of black lives. Um, so I, I find myself um, resisting some of those frameworks, even as I operate from a place of care. 
I think that um, this has been an incredibly challenging time to lead. It, I see job postings for director level positions everywhere. And I think that probably says a lot about the challenges for folks who are trying to lead through this time. Um, I think that uh, Mary talked about having a board that is really ready and in alignment to support really resonates with me. I feel like I do have that board now and I'm very grateful for all the people who've stayed committed to Split This Rock and the new folks who've come into position. Um, and we're still going to be growing that board and I, I would say for any organization really think carefully about how and who you want to have in a board space. So if you're in a leadership or staff position. Mm -hmm. um, the other things that I would say, um, Split This Rock is a convening organization. So we host spaces for people to gather um, across multiple communities, across uh, race, across generation, across gender, sexuality, geography. And that's something that we've focused on. And that's definitely been a balm for me. Mm -hmm. um, both in our programs, but also in uh, the national work that we do. So really showing up for some of these coalition conversations and being present to the challenge. And I think that that's where I have found meaning through this time, even if it hasn't always been comforting. Um, but the energy to stay engaged as we watch multiple reckonings happen across political landscapes, but also within the literary field itself, there are a lot of our peer organizations that have been struggling to address, um, and I mean, I appreciate Carol speaking about this too, the, the legacies and reckonings that many organizations are having to face. I think Split This Rock has been trying to be intentional about how do we look inward. And I wanna lift up our staff as a whole, because I think that it is true that there are, there are unique challenges to trying to be this inside outside leader where you're like trying to caretake and nurture and coordinate on the inside and also advocate and defend and protect and bring in resources from the outside. But um, I really wanna praise the leadership of the staff at Split This Rock. Uh, and that I think this is a time where folks did so much work and then for a festival had to stop and then had to undo it all. And it, and, you know, watching it was um, uh, heart wringing for me to uh, mm -hmm. all the work that we had to do as a team. Um, I think something else that has been supportive for me um, and grounding for me is paying attention to, um, I wanna credit my colleague, Chelsea Irolano. When we were thinking about communication strategies a couple of years ago, uh, we were thinking about moments, like what is important for us to communicate and when do we need to speak? When do we need to do something else? And uh, Chelsea's comment, she was trying to remember another organization of ours, Furious Flower, a, a partner, peer organization of ours, Furious Flower, that's based at James Madison University. She's trying to remember the name and she said, who's the flower, right? And this question of like, who is the flower in any particular moment is one that has stayed with me through multiple reckonings and crises. So that sometimes our organization's work isn't always what needs to be centered. And I think in this time, trying to lean into these um, relationships and community, who else is resources, who else is work, do we need to, can, how can we be a portal? How can we be a gateway through which our audiences and communities connect to other things that are meaningful? Um, definitely relieve some of the pressure on a four person organization to feel like as a social justice organization, we always need to have the answer or like be right or have the narrative. Um, how do we pay attention to who else is doing that work and be in alignment with them and in support of them? There's so much I'll pause. Ah. No, but it's it's really interesting to hear. Um, I think I must have been maybe at, at a university in Boston, at Boston University actually, some years ago, and there was work around a resilience index to... Um, to sort of capture, you know, how do communities survive, drought, famine, different things that happen. Um, and resilience isn't, isn't always, you know, it's not a badge of honor. It's a, maybe it's a, it's a show, it's a place of exhaustion. It's a place of, I'm hanging on for dear life, but I'm actually quite exhausted. You know, it's not a, I've risen above it and now I can take on more challenges necessarily, you know. 
So it's it's really interesting that you you couch it this way. Um, I thought then when I was reading some of the literature uh, some years ago, I thought, well, you yeah, you know, resilience isn't always shouldn't always be the goal either. You know, it's sort of where you land by default um, in some ways. Um, it's really also um, good to think through. You know. Yes, there's community on the inside. Yes, there's, but the demands don't sh slow down or or change. You know, a person who's has other illnesses besides COVID is still going to be ill. Life, the rest of life is still going on, so the demands are still there. Um, and so there's 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 no pulling out of it to uh, find yourself any kind of respite or time or time out. And so it's it's very important to think about what other what are other people doing and how can we, um, you know, shine a light on what they're doing um, and not have to invent the wheel every single time um, for, for some of the work that we do. Um, I know there's been quite a bit of, you know, meltdown in terms of how organizations have been able to function. Um, and actually, no, I'll, 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 I'll wait for a second. I'll pause there for a second to, um, to speak more directly, Carol, to your experience, um, we saw, as everyone did, across the arts um, and culture uh, communities, that there was a lot of reckoning happening. There was a lot that was kind of bubbling up and um, uh, a lot of sort of solidarity statements were being put out. And, uh, and um, then there were commentaries about those solidarity statements. And so there was quite a lot of active engagement um, around social justice, but for the arts um, in all the ways that 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 manifested. Um, what That's were some point. of <laughs> the ways, <laughs> Carol? What were some of the ways that you um, found useful? What were some of the tools that you found useful in navigating, um, or even you know, if not issues coming up, even just how do we deal with equity? Uh, the organizations may ask that question of themselves now, where do we begin? You know, what, what do we look at? What structures do we look at? How has that journey been for you with um, Joy of Motion and, and others as, as you've experienced it as well? well it's, it's still happening. It's certainly still happening mm. because the fallout is tremendous. And, you know, this was a, and I don't mind saying it, it this was a 45, well, now it was then a 44-year-old white privileged organization. And so having to reckon with that and look at sort of the backlog of trauma behind it was hard for the organization, hard for a lot of people within the organization too. And I, I would say to other people, there's so many, it's like working with abused wives or something because, because everyone was so hurt and traumatized and had never been able to bring it to the forefront like they were at this point in time. So, you know, trying to go back, we we still deal with it uh, on the staff level, the faculty level, the student level, the community level, all of that. So we know that we can't we can't go back and fix it, but we only know we can move forward with something that is more than words. And until the actions are there, for me, for I feel for anybody, until actions are really there that people see happening, then you really, there's no change. There's no change. And, you know, I, for other organizations that I work with, I always ask them, be they organizations of color or not, the importance is for us to define this word equity. What does that mean? What does that mean? And really uh, look at, are we listening to what we're saying? Do we understand? Because it doesn't mean just bring people of color on your board. It doesn't mean just hire more faculty of color. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean those illusions of inclusion. It means you really have to do some, some real work, some real work to understand. And I, I, work with people outside of DC. I have a group in San Diego that I'm working with. And 
in talking with the board chair, he said, well, you know, our demographics are white, white, and white. And so I said, well, that's fine. But what you can do, you, you know, because you may not have a region where you can reach out to a lot of people of color, but what you can do, you can teach the history. You can just teach the history because there's so many young people, be they black, white, yellow, pink, whatever, they don't know the history of any of our cultures that have, have really made an impact and brought culture to this country. So the importance of getting that across, uh, it was a ballet company. So I said, you know, the contributions of black ballerinas and blacks in ballet is just amazing. And you can teach that, you can teach that. So I think we're gonna be dealing with this for a while and I hope we are. Um, I hope we can ride the wave, um, you know, International Association of Blacks in Dance. We are unabashedly happy to be Black Dance. We don't mind being Black Dance. We will, you know, embrace it in any way, shape or form, but we are Black Dance and we don't mind that. And we, we do believe that reparations are due. Reparations are due because no matter how you twist it, turn it, shape it, color it with a crayon, the inequities have been there forever. And so it, there's a lot of repair to be done. You know, so I, I think doing the work on a daily basis and really looking, um, I know we will probably get to talking about the systems that, are, that really don't work for us. And there are a lot of systems that don't work for us, you know, and changing those systems. And, and like, I like what Rasha was saying about, you know, connecting and collaborating, because unless we all work together, nobody's going to work, you know, mm -hmm. like Baba Chuck Davis said a long time ago, um, he said, if, if, if we learn what <laughs> on cue, <laughs> Da, 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 da. <laughs> I love it. Stripper <laughs> fall. <laughs> Had to take up that new profession. <laughs> <Was off. laughs> you know? But if he, he said, if we learn what's black about what's wonderful about black culture, then we all benefit. We all mm -hmm. grow. And it's the same with black culture, with all culture. If we if we learn. And the education is the key. We got to learn, mm -hmm. you know, we all have to learn. So I, I just think the work is, is just beginning and we just have to be committed to continue to make that work happen and not let it, oh, it's just a trend, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. let it go. We have to be committed to the work of equity. And embed it in everything, not just have it be a separate activity off on its side, but really, you know, bring it into everything that you do um, in that way. Um, how has equity showed up in your worlds, Mary and uh, Rasha? Let me do Rasha first, just for the hell of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess maybe I'll start a, a little more abstract. And then I, I want to come to some things that are more specific. Um, I think that the what the experience of the pandemic has meant for Split This Rock is a, a renewed attention and recommitment to core values that were already present from the birth of the organization, but a um, really attention to greater specificity about how those show up in our work and how they need to, how practices need to grow to meet changing conditions. So uh, some bigger things that I wanna talk about before I talk about what, what goes beyond DEI, because I'm, um, Carol, I appreciate you asking that question. Um, I'm here for liberation, like mm -hmm. that's what I want. I want, mm -hmm. way, I want way more than equity, mm -hmm. I want liberation. I hear you. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, I think the, for me, I, I think that there's so many layers of that within our own communities, right? Um, I think about how do we address consent? How do we center values of consent rather than command um, in our workplaces and in our relationships with community? 
uh, in our relationships with young people, in our relationships with artists? How, as leaders, do we think about care rather than discipline and punishment? So um, for me, I, I refused to do any of these like monitoring and surveillance tracking systems, right? And so you talk to consultants and they'll tell you, oh, we should, no, we're not going to do that. So um, I think that some of these things that folks don't think about as like diversity, equity, and inclusion, right, are actually about creating a, a, a caring workplace, um, or at least a humane, a more humane, even if it's not perfectly humane. And then how, when there are challenges or reckonings that come up, do we approach it with humility, curiosity, attention, gratitude? Like if someone has brought critique to our organization, how do we approach that as a gift, right? As an invitation to learn and to be accountable, how accountability is a gift. And that rather than having like pride and, and assuming that we've already arrived, even if we're, a, especially for a social justice organization, assuming that we already have it right or, um, or ignoring right and not paying attention when there are like small indications that maybe something needs more attention or when there are big indications that something needs more attention and if i were to say, like name sort of a few areas that i think we've attended to Lutus rock has long had um in addition to you know, a liberatory framework a racial justice framework um disability justice has been really core to split this rocks work and making work accessible at least to grow our accessibility processes as much as we can in a world that is built not to provide accessibility um and i think that's one of the places where we're going to name something that was like resilience or innovation that we've expanded those um supports during the time of the pandemic and it's something that we've really um, tried to push as well to offer more resources to our peer groups um, that, you know, if folks are going to offer virtual programming, how do we make it as accessible as possible uh, and not stop doing that once we go back to in-person or hybrid programming? Um, and then thinking about labor justice, how do we do just work in a just way? And I think that is really the layer of the work that Split This Rock is really present to right now. Um, what does it mean to talk about justice for our communities if our staff are burned out? Uh, and if that, you know, that's a pattern across social justice organizations, nonprofits in general, and how do we uh, resist that as part of our liberation work and uh, recognize the different, um, consequences, pressures, or experiences that people have in those spaces based on the intersection of identity that they live at and have to work at um, and multiple layers. I think one of the things that Split This Rock has been committed to is thinking about um, when we do representation, we're, curate, we're curating in a really um, multi-layered way. And so uh, there isn't, uh, it isn't just about like, um, diversity across communities and tokenizing, but it's like within communities, how do we think about a range of perspectives and and then also think about how that connects us across communities? Um, so that's that's what I'll say. That's amazing. Thank you, Rasha. That's that's a lot of insight. Thank you. I'll try um, to respond in the chat too, because I notice people are saying things. Oh, I should I I don't have my chat open either. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mary. Yeah, well, I mean, when 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 people, it's like uh, the whole equity thing got got sexy, and you can kind of figure out when that was. But from my very beginning, twenty five years ago, we had to grapple with it because we thought, oh yeah, this is an organization with black boys and young men, and of course we're going to have, you know, we'll get all these black men or whatever else, and then. Uh, Cal Surprise, our volunteers were coming from George Washington University and American University. And then we, we learned that that uh, the construct of volunteerism at some of the HBCUs, there needed to be work there where you could have uh, black volunteerism on a consistent basis. That's a whole nother conversation. But, but thankfully, we moved uh, in, in a lot of directions. But since our conception, if you were to visit our website, You'll see Larry B. Quick 
a, 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 a boxer, a black, a black boxer from Kenilworth, uh, who traded in his boxing gloves for a painting brush. You'll see Ben Johnson, a white Germanic man who grew up on a Bruderhof. And you'll see you'll see me, who I was very fortunate to have a mom and dad from a Catholic background initially. Uh, and and we all just kind of came together uh, on this call. We have one of our uh, founding uh, foundation, Sister Allie Bird. I'm not gonna even call her a race or anything right now. I'll let her call herself. <laughs> and so my thing is, you know, it's like from our conception, again, our existence has been a resistance. We've had to deal with volunteers that would come to us who uh, were from different backgrounds and they would change their vernacular and change their dress to try to assimilate into black culture. And we had to go, hold up, wait a minute, you can't, you can't do that. You know, uh, you know, and, 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 and we've had to work with uh, volunteers and staff who came from different cultures who really hated themselves because they were white. And I'm like, hold up, wait a minute, you can't work with our black boys and young men and help them love themselves and you don't love yourself. So from 25 years ago, we had to figure out how do we, and, and, and then we were asked the question, is it our job as an organization that uses artistic expression to serve black men and boys, is it your job to enlighten white folks? And I had to think about that for a minute with the founders. I was like, uh, that might be an affirmative, given that that's who we have right now who are, are working in reading, writing, and arithmetic with my, my boys. So we've had to take that on very early on. I am so with Sister Rasha. I'm glad I'm not off the chart here. So it was when <laughs> years ago and people were like, well, how many of this and count how many of this and then how many are gay and how many are this and how many are straight and how many? I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so what's great is that we kind of naturally fit in that because we've just been a motley. We've been just like this very different group uh, from the very beginning, tied together by love, security, and expression. And our focus, yes, has been liberation, has been freedom has been Kuji Takalia. Our, our, our focus has been Ubuntu. I am because you are, you are because I am. Our focus has always been shared humanity. So when you come to, and maybe one member of our team could put it in the chat, one of our Color Me communities, if you were to come to one of our Color Me communities that was created out of our need for us to come together in Ubuntu, different background, different identity, you'll see that what we tackle are kind of all the isms, identity, so no one can stand behind the shield of equity, and but yet, 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 they, yet they're boiling in misogyny. They can't stand behind the shield of racism, but yet they are homo homophobic or they're against. So yeah, so there you are. So that's how we, it's just really, you know, I really give thanks. It's really who who we've been. And I, I know I put something in the chat because Sister Rasha was so correct about resilience. Mm. But so, I think because like pieces is extraordinary, we have the, the gift, but, but us working with black boys and young men in some of the most challenging areas, it's, and, and I know we define it as resilience, but, but like, it's like, we eat that as appetizers. Because that's how you survive. <laughs> you, you gotta survive because it's this crisis and there's going to be another crisis, but we got you, crack the neck, whatever, and it is trauma. We probably do need to take a minute to assess the overall <laughs> piece of it, but yeah, I, I don't know. M maybe when we do questions and answers, members of our team can mm. speak more to it, but it's, I, I, I kid you not, I can't stop. I know those four C's seem very, very elementary, but that is how we've navigated that from the mm. very beginning. When, when we, you know, when, when our, when our boys and young men have been shot in the street to, to, to whatever sex abuse molestation that might happen in households that nobody talks about, which might involve little boys, to, we truly have used art as a tool to save lives. And it's what we breathe and eat. And in the midst of it, we have to celebrate. So we have to find a peace in that, in that existence. So. But but I think I, I thank you, Mary. That, that you know I think what it speaks to is also existing strengths, existing ways, existing um, you know mechanisms that we have as individuals, as communities. The strengths are there, and as occasion calls, 
you know, we kind of activate those strengths, if you will, to, to sort of, you know, meet the moment. Um, however, that shows up, you know, we, we step up to the moment with those strengths. Um, if, if you were, if we were collectively to reflect on, you know, sort of organizational strengths, what were, what was there that, that really helped, um, helped in navigating what happened after COVID uh, or with COVID, um, what, what would you all say were the existing strengths that, that the organizations had? I think, for example, in our case with the commission, I could say, I, I think most of us would say staff were a big, you know, a big strength, a big building block and a big, big strength. I think for, for me, I can, I can also say the diversity that existed that exists with, you know, in terms of perspectives, age, um, um, experience, um, art forms, training in different arts and humanities backgrounds, um, and just personalities, you know, the, the diversity of personalities that we had um, was a strength. Um, the conversations uh, were, were able to be, you know, in some ways, frank. Um, there was some vulnerability, but I think that there was strength in that in that sharing um, that we experienced. Um, I think as an agency, you know, we, we're, we're an independent, becoming an independent agency in some ways, still in the becoming phases of it. Um, but there was some strength to um, understanding what that meant. You know, where do we have flexibility? How do we uh, use aspects of this independence to kind of retool? Um, that was a strength. Um, so, so what existing strengths were there that that you could safely say, okay, this piece, this piece, this piece, these are the pillars, and 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 we can build from there. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Ms. Rasha, and work backwards this time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I have some short answers. Hopefully, I think I can be pretty concise. Um, practically within Split This Rock. Um, we had the advantage of already having a lot of remote systems in place. So not everything, and it wasn't perfect, but we already had an experience of staff working flexible hours and sometimes working from home. So uh, the initial transition to working from home, we still had access to our files on the server. We already had uh, we already had a Zoom account set up. We already had some other things in place that made um, remote work, remote office more possible. Um, and we had been practicing, so it wasn't completely, uh, completely unusual. There were still a lot of adaptations. Um, another piece that I will say is that um, because Split This Rock has a long history of really frank social justice positioning, uh, mm -hmm as a leader through these multiple experiences. Uh, so for example, when the uprisings began in Minneapolis in response to the murder of George Floyd, um, Split This Rock was able to make a statement of solidarity that was grounded in the reality of having a board member who was on the ground in the Twin Cities organizing. And we featured a poem by that same board member that had been performed at the 2014 festival. So it wasn't, we just got so I think that that um, grounding and that history of relationships and work uh, has helped us to be grounded in this time and I think has also helped um, us speak frankly. Um, and I think it'll be interesting as we keep speaking frankly about what transformations we think um, might be coming for the organization that uh, I feel confident about the readiness of community, um, volunteers, board members, artists, teaching artists, audiences, youth poets, scholars, that uh, folks will come with us on that journey. And I think having that confidence across such a range of audiences and folks um, is really amazing to have. And I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm very grateful also for the groundings and work of folks like my colleagues, Kanisha Jones, um, I'm going to name all my colleagues and Alexandria Petrassi and Chelsea Giorgiano in doing youth development work and centering youth led youth organizing in doing disability justice and accessibility work, especially in all of our online communications. 
uh, that I think put us in a really good position to grow from where we have and keep growing um, rather than having to do it all for the first time. So I've been grateful. Excellent. Thank you. Either one, <laughs> Ms. Carol or Ms. Mary. Uh, well, I, I, I'll be very quick. Five quick things. A non, we had clear alignment around our non-negotiable reason for being. I think every organization, if you could have that defined, that gives you your mar marching orders. Two, a very clearly defined process that has been rooted over a period of time that we use from our three-year-olds to in the boardroom when we're doing strategy. I think uh, that's two. Three, what we really had was this amazing team, staff, which we were able to do in-person uh, uh, um, hybrid with no outbreak. We were able to hold on to our entire staff. We actually built our staff. And so we had this amazing team, but inherent in that number three was our ability to adjust. Oh, how do we do this in HR? How do we make certain, oh, can you, oh so you, hi, you, can, you need to get five days off with pay because you need to be tested, that kind of thing. That's, that's three. I think the fourth piece was our ability to tell our story. So when you see, you know, someone like a sister Ali leading our mission advancement team, who's, you know, we, we were able to bring in artists, uh, Sister Mignote, Maquette Productions, we were able to use our art to tell our story through video. And so by telling our story, we could carry everybody with us during a time that they couldn't come for a site visit. And then the fifth thing that led to was that partnerships. And, and resources began to came in, come in, and then that gave us the full cycle back into our non-negotiable reason for being. So that those were, those are the five things I feel that we had in place that helped us uh, to navigate this madness. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. You're mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to take mine from uh, to here because <laughs> um, with IBD, we were able to really have some great open dialogue and I think the staff really grew and was more productive and fruitful in the pandemic because we were trying to see how we would tie it all together and make it work for other organizations. And so, you know, we were able to put an emergency fund together. We were able to do a lot in terms of that. When, um, when I got out into the field, I saw that a lot of people just needed checking in on. And so they just needed somebody checking in on them to see how they were doing. And they were doing, and they were utilizing <laughs> their staffs in, in the best way they could see fit. But there was a lot, there was still a lot of uh, need for how to navigate this time. And so no one really had all the questions um, or all the answers. I had more questions and answers to things, but still trying to get people to see it's not gonna be forever. It's not gonna last forever and just keep that at the forefront of your, your mind. And then when I got to Joy of Motion, it was like, child, get the church fan out. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna take all that. <laughs> oh my goodness, it, there was, it was, everything was in flux, you know, it was just, so I think the thing that, that really kept us going was the fact that we were all new board members. We were all women who were wanting to make things work. And so unlike most boards, we committed since October to meeting every Thursday for a work meeting and trying to pull things together and unravel and figure out what's going on uh, because Joy Emotion had more issues than Jet Magazine. <laughs> You know, we, and we're, still, we're still in that place. We are still in that place. But I think it is a compliment to the staff and to the board 
uh, because we may be at different uh, places on the spectrum, but everybody wants the organization to come up with a new face, a new being, uh, a new energy. And um, so I think that's been the greatest tool that everyone is at least on the same plate with that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to I want to say something about resilience too because it, you know that word like we said should we have to do that I I proudly stand on resilience because my people oh my goodness my people you know if it weren't for our resilience I look at m my own being it would not be here today mm -hmm. whether it was forced or whether it was uh something that we just knew we had none of that matters because of the the people that i know um had that i'm gonna keep going when they could have said i'm not doing this you know they could have just jumped overboard when they were mm -hmm. coming forward, and they didn't and so i i'm gonna i'm gonna say that you know that there is Resilience has to stand on a higher plane than it does because it is not everyone has it. Not everyone is able to do it. Mm. And, you know, if we can teach it, if we can make all those young black men know that they have that within their DNA, you know, if we can make all those black women know that they have it within their DNA, then, mm. you know, we will, we will really raise up a people. We will raise mm. people. So, mm. you know, I, I had to speak to that because I, I think, you know, we've got to take all the good pieces and keep pushing those forward. We mm. have to really take the good pieces and push them forward. Those those are the perfect words to uh, wrap up the discussion portion of this with my just huge, huge thanks for your insights and your your thoughts and your candidness um in this in this conversation i've really enjoyed hearing uh, from all of you and being in community with you um i would love to open it up for questions i think we have about 10 minutes um if anything is coming in through the so, um chat so yes devon I don't see any hands raised but i did get a question from the chat um rasha was already speaking to it but i thought okay. it would great um if the other panelists had the opportunity to ask and she asked what practices do you have in place um to support burned out staff and that's from marissa summers mm -hmm. um i would love uh, a member of our team to speak to that uh, mm -hmm. uh if you I raise your hands we can unmute you yeah well, may maybe i put them on the spot <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brother Mo? Mm. Is he raising his hand? I don't know. I can't see him. Brother Maurice? Uh, oh, oh, oh. oh, he's raising okay. his hand. Okay. You see him? Um, yeah, I sent the request. Devon? Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Oh, is that going to be difficult? Because they, they can't. No, it won't be. It won't be. He'll, he'll unmute in a minute. Should be able to. And so, the, repeat the question again. What what practices do we to to help with um, the staff burnout? How have you how have you coped with staff burnout? What's helped? Absolutely. Once you uh, unmute Maurice, I'll be able to. But but definitely, you have to have a, a, a you you need the resources, but then have these flexible HR processes because you, if if we're going to keep everybody employed, if someone needs to be tested. And let's say they're hourly, then you need a board that will work with you and you need to have the resources to have that person's back. You need the resources mm -hmm. if you're going to do in person to have some level of hazard pay or, you know, if, if there's a week off for something, well, then we can pay for that week. So it's being able to love your staff with the resources they need. So I don't know. I, I don't think we got Brother Mo yet. I'm, um, mm -hmm. everyone hear me? Oh, no. Danelle, Danelle, okay. D. You got me? Correct? My audio is good? Yes. Yeah. I think in the meantime, um, our staff isn't too big, but however, um, I think just the ability to multitask, um, which really helped us out, won't get burnt out mentally or physically. 
um, which really helps. So even if someone had one test, if you're okay at it or you can excel or maybe you know the gist of it, I'm just able to help everyone out. So multitasking helped us a bit. So um, helped us a lot actually. So we actually didn't get, um, I guess we did get burnt out. I'm not going to completely. <laughs> Factor where, um, yeah, it, it kind of shifted um, tasks and abilities. Um, so we didn't get burnt out uh, physically or mentally too bad because we were able to, I guess, shift tasks in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Brother Maurice, no? <laughs> he wasn't able to get on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he has his hand up. Hello? Yes, sir. Please go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't get myself mute. Um, I think I would add to Do Brother Donnell's response would be that um, communication made it easier um, with our weekly staff meetings. And then we had individual meetings. Um, staff were always in communication. So you kind of get a sense or a pulse of how someone's feeling or certain days, certain people might need to take care of different things. I think one, one thing that really stands out to me, which is really, really from the very beginning, is I am a staff person, but I belong to a family. Um, so I think a lot of pieces kind of have a different approach where we we are staff, we are workers. However, we have a, a family atmosphere. Um, so you kind of get a pulse from your cousin. You kind of get a pulse from your aunt or your mother that, you know what, take today off. You know, you got to prepare yourself because we know how we value and work, know how hard each one of our staff people go when they are on the clock. So oftentimes when you uh, need breaks, it's okay because we embrace each other as a family. Um, so I'm always interested, interested and concerned about my, my neighbor. I'm always consistent consistently um, and so ready to support my staff. So it's a family atmosphere that allows that flexibility and then it kind of uh, doesn't allow as much stress as you're dealing with the circumstances. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's really a treat to have you guys speak to this. Thank you for joining, like speaking up and letting us hear your voices too. And so with that being said, before we part ways, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everybody. Um, mm. Hopefully you all can see that. Oh, yes, the video. Yes, the ATMO, and then we will connect. Right is connect. Let's start it from the video. Right is connect. Connect. Right is create. Create. Right is contribute. Contribute. Right is celebrate. Celebrate. The name of this painting is Connect. We must first connect with ourselves to connect with others. We develop an atmosphere for reflection and introspection and share our experiences and knowledge with others. Connect. The name of this painting is Create. Expressing our emotions and experiences of literary and performing arts. Bringing out what we're feeling inside. Create. Human painting is trivial. We all just know that we have something to offer. We can have a say in making our world and our community a better place. Trivial. The name of this painting is Celebrate. Embrace the uniqueness of each of us and enjoy life. Celebrate. We recognize the world may see us with our hands to the sky and think of gun violence or police brutality. It is a shame we live in a world with so much violence that if a black man has his hands up, even in celebration, our minds envision death and violence. We're here to connect, create, contribute, and celebrate with each other. And so that uh, finishes us up, and we are still in respect to everybody's time. So I want to say, uh, if 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 Iran, uh, oh, of course. Devonia, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you, CAH team, so much. I um, this has been so good. This has been so good, and I look forward to more. Um, I know it's making me teary too, <laughs> Mary. I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to see, um, you know, to see, to see community and to be with community and to be in this creative. Um, venture together trying to survive it and trying to still make towards a positive vision together it's it's been a beautiful um couple of hours we've spent together thank you all rasha thank you for your for your profound thoughts and 
I look forward to more. I say this with sincerity. I hope there's more and thank you all for showing up and, and being with us today. Um, Devon and Patrick, thank you for making it all such a smooth, smooth um, afternoon, technologically speaking as well. Thank you. Um, and so with that being said, everybody who uh, was here today, this session will be available um, at a later date on our website at dcrs.dc.gov. Uh, for you to view this conversation back, share it with your friends. Um, and then also, again, you can find all of the information. There are links within the chat. Um, and if you have any suggestions or any type of uh, content that you would like to see or any conversations that you would like to see and hear about, um, you can email myself at devon.dc.gov uh, or you can uh, go ahead and send that to dcch. No, CAH at DC.gov. My apologies. And so I'm going to just go ahead, thank everybody. You can follow. I'm going to drop my information here. So I'll leave this open um, until everybody heads out. But I just want to thank everybody for giving us this time today. And we look forward to seeing you all and providing you all with content in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Lusane. Good job. Thank you, Cancer. <laughs> Appreciate that. Fine. This long, long time friend, man. We went to the same high school. It's interesting. Uh, uh, you? Like <laughs> Thank you, Devon. I'm so sorry for I don't know why. I was on a call this morning and it was working perfectly. Technology uh, looks man. technology is what technology is. I like I told you, we're gonna, we gonna make it work, make it happen. I done dealt yep. with a yep. slew of hiccups on my own end. <laughs> your Wi-Fi go out, you gotta use your phone router. <laughs> yes, listen, I said, let me try something else. Oh my goodness. Thank goodness. I'm glad I went to a colored college. <laughs> but you all enjoy. It was a pleasure having you and I will be following up um, after this shortly. So thank you. You all thank enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.